Good morning once again. We are continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark today, if you're just joining us, and we're all the way into the latter part of chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. If you brought a Bible and you want to follow along, please turn to that chapter. Be there in a minute. A mother was preparing pancakes for her sons, Kevin, who was five years old, and Ryan, who was three years old. And the boys at the breakfast table began arguing about who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw a teaching moment and said, you know, guys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let your brother have the first pancake. I can wait. So Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. Okay. As we continue in the Gospel of Luke today, our lesson involves being like Jesus. Jesus, if you followed us so far, realizes that his disciples still don't understand his mission and purpose here on earth, so Jesus pulls away from the crowds and begins in the rest of chapter 9 to teach his disciples alone by themselves so they understand the gospel and how to live it. And he's having quite a time doing that. So for the third time in the gospel Mark, Jesus begins to outline what will happen to him, which, as we talked about before, are the main elements of the gospel. I'm just going to read it. We've been over it before, but this helps us get to the context as he pulls his disciples aside for these very, very important truths. In Mark chapter 9, I'll break in at verses 30 to 37 first, where we've been, and then we'll continue on in a minute. Mark chapter 9, verse 30, And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he was unwilling for anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise again three days later. But they didn't understand this statement, and they're afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. He said, what were you guys discussing on the way? But they kept silent. On the way, they discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him into his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me doesn't just receive me, but him who sent me. Now, if we have understood the gospel of Jesus and are living by it, it will be seen in how we treat others. This is what catches Jesus with his disciples. They don't get it. Jesus realized they can hear what he's been saying they don't know how it applies to them. So the disciples start arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Jesus explains as he did, if you want to understand what I'm all about, it's to be a servant of all. That's how you're great in God's eyes. And to borrow a Star, Star Trek phrase, I would call this the disciples' prime directive. Prime directive. And then he illustrated that by taking and hugging a little child in their midst and said, receiving somebody like this, welcoming them and loving them, is like you're doing it to me. But no, so no sooner did Jesus get done with his mild rebuke, uh, taking and talking about receiving others like he would receive a child, that John got, Apostle John speaks up with a concern about someone who was ministering in Jesus' name outside their group. And again, in the passage we're going to look at today, it's almost like they didn't hear a thing. 
and it prompts Jesus to use some of the strongest language yet, yet to rebuke them. Again, this is just directed at the disciples. They believe in him. He's the Messiah. He's trying to explain what's going to happen to him. This is the gospel. He's trying to illustrate what that means. Here's what you need to be doing to live this out, the truth of this. So let's look at the rest as he continues. In verse 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there's no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me, for he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him with a heavy, if have a, have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he'd been cast into the sea, and if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands and go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die, where their fire is not quenched, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die, their fire is not quenched, and if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what? Will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This passage really rattled me. Okay. Uh, I, I deliberately, intentionally took this section on hell out and I talked, I taught on it last time. I'm not going to deal with that this week. Well, I'm going to try to talk about what on earth is he telling his disciples, those people who believed in him. Jesus is the gospel, and he serves us and will serve us, as he explains, by sacrificing his own life for our benefit so that we may receive eternal life. When we believe in Jesus and become his follower, the content of the gospel we believe moves from just content to actually impact our life. That's what Jesus is trying to point out. We'll talk about today. You know, the Apostle John, they, Jesus just gave them a mild rebuke. You guys are talking about which one of you is the greatest? That's, you're not thinking right. That not, has nothing to do with, with the gospel. The John pipes up, and he, he says, You know, Lord, I, I understand about being nice to little kids. Uh, but what about this guy? He's over there casting out demons in your name, but he's not following with the right group, us. You can imagine, can't you, what Jesus must be thinking. They still don't get it. Do you see the relevance of this passage to us today? Do you see this? Oh my gosh. We're not criticizing a person for casting out demons that are not part of our elite group. Disciples today are criticizing other believers who have different political affiliations, a different philosophy in response to the pandemic. Hey, they're, they're way off base. They're not following what we're following. Do you see it? It affects disciples through all time. 
not only these guys, but we have to watch it. This is his strongest rebuke. On what basis are you dividing? John's concern, as I said earlier, prompted Jesus, and this is extensive, his longest, most intense response to his disciples in this private session before he goes back to minister to the crowds again. And I said, this passage rattled me, personally, convicting me. It's interesting, you see, because John's concern about these, uh, this other disciple that Jesus, John's concern highlights the real problem Jesus tried to address with them. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Notice John doesn't say, because this guy, should we hinder him? Because this guy's not following you. You know what he says? He's not following us. <laughs> John's focus isn't on Jesus. He's focused on a very limited, selfish, elitist perspective. Their group of disciples. We're with the Master, after all, the Lord himself. And this suggests John is still thinking greatness in terms of the world's metrics. What group are you part of? We're the true disciples, not these other guys. Now you can, you can also pick up a little comparison and envy of John's concern. Not, not long ago, if you remember in chapter 9, the, the disciples, these disciples had tried to cast out a demon of someone, and they couldn't do it. But this guy is managing miraculously to cast out demons. Oh. Hmm. So there's disciples being successful. Listen, the first principle of living out the gospel to to really understand it is to become a servant. If we don't get that, we really haven't understood the gospel. To be a servant, not a critical judge. The main indication we're living out as a servant in line with the truth of the gospel is how we treat other disciples. It begins there. Do we welcome them, even though they're different, think different, not part of our group? Or do we judge and criticize them, remove ourselves from them, even though they're identifying themselves with Jesus and the power of the gospel in their lives? There's, a great, th- there's examples of this in many places, but one of my favorites is the example in Uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, where he talks about confronting the apostle Peter because he was not walking in line with the gospel. What was he doing? He was separating himself from other believers because some Jews came along and said, hey, you shouldn't be associating with them. They don't think the way we do, or believe the way we do. Galatians 2, 11 to 14, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he with, began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in that hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy, when I saw that they were not walking in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? He's basically confronting his racism. 
It's not in line with the gospel. This elitism, this superiority thinking, this nothing to do with Jesus. Mark 9.39, uh, Jesus answers John emphatically, and he says, no, <laughs> no, do not hinder him. Do not discourage, speak evil of, judge, or hinder another disciple serving in Jesus' name. I can't tell you how intense Jesus is right here. He's disappointed in these disciples. That's why he's called them aside. They still don't get it. <laughs> Keep in mind, they, these disciples had just finished arguing about which one of them is the greatest in their elitist group. Which was the better disciple? Now, perhaps out of envy, jealousy, pride, or some other sin, they've judged and disqualified this other disciple because he's not part of their group. Jesus rebukes them soundly, and he tells them why. And what we see next are really four reasons Jesus said we should not hinder another disciple who's serving Jesus in Jesus' name. And the four reasons, if you read the passage, are signaled in the text by the word for. Because. So as we go through Jesus' teaching, notice how he moves from this particular person uh, that John brought to Jesus' attention to applying the gospel application to anyone who identifies themselves as a follower of Jesus. In other words, the context of this teaching concerns how we, as disciples of Christ, treat other believers in Jesus. The first reason, he says, not to hinder another disciple is for, because if they're ministering in Jesus' name, they've identified themselves with Jesus and they're not going to speak evil of Jesus. Mark 9, 39. Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and soon be afterwards speak evil of me. Second reason we shouldn't hinder another disciple from serving is because, for, if the person's not against us, that means they're for us. The next two reasons, and I need you to mark them well, number three and four that Jesus gives go together. They're opposite responses to how we treat other disciples. The first one helps a disciple, and the second one hurts a disciple. Two different consequences. First, the third reason we shouldn't hinder another disciple from serving Jesus is because for whoever helps another person belonging to Christ will be rewarded by God in eternity. You want to help them, serve them? God's taken note of that. In fact, what's very fascinating to me in verse 41, he just says, if you just give them a cup of water, that is not going to be unrewarded. Something that simple. Some little gesture of love. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, you, because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, you will not lose his reward. Something that small, that simple. But let's look at the other one. Hurt. Whoa. On the other side, the fourth reason we shouldn't hinder another disciple in serving Jesus is, is followed by, and whoever causes someone who believes in Jesus to stumble will face severe judgment, punishment. Mark 9, 42, whoever, the same context. context. Somebody's helping a disciple, somebody's hurting a disciple. Two different consequences. Here's the second one. Whoever caused one of these little ones, listen to me, who believe in me. He's talking about believers. To stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck he'd been cast into the sea.
This is some very, very, very strong language that he's going to start off here. <clears throat> first, first of all, the little ones he's talking about are children because he qualifies them according to his, their relationship with Jesus. They believe. They're believers. And he calls them his little ones. This warning concerns how we treat anyone who's a believer in Jesus. Causing them to stumble, what that means is hindering them from following Jesus because of how we treated them. Oh, I could tell you stories of people I've talked to who've turned away from Jesus because of Christians acting badly. Watch out. <laughs> oh, Jesus is coming unglued with this. Uh, we'll be held accountable. I can summarize the main point of what Jesus is giving his disciples. The prime directive for his disciples is serve other believers in Jesus. Don't sin against them because of our own desire to be superior or first. But then Jesus amps it up. Just so they get it, <laughs> Jesus is going to go... He's going to launch into this uh, warning about sin's horrible consequences that are, we're headed into after we die. He talks about if your hand causes your symbols, cut it off. But note this well. It's better for you to enter life crippled. Cut it off. Don't do it. Uh, if, you're, if your hand, if, you're, if your foot causes, cut it off. Uh, if your eye causes your symbol, throw it out. It's better you to, oh, enter the kingdom of God. He's talking about believers entering the kingdom of God who will enter life. These are not believers who enter hell. He's talking about the severe consequences, sobering consequences for when we sin against another believer, it has eternal consequences in our life. It's either going to be rewarded or it's going to, it's going to, we're going to lose something. We're venturing now in the deep theological waters. Uh, and this passage, and what Jesus means, I've got to be honest, has been a topic of great debate for hundreds of years. I don't have all the answers. I'm just going to give you my perspective. Keep in mind, he's talking to disciples, not talking to the crowds. And he's talking to disciples about how disciples are supposed to treat other disciples. And because of the way he says it, he doesn't want us to miss how serious God takes this. When we hinder someone's faith because of our sin toward them, pride, selfishness, jealousy, unforgiveness, critical spirit, we don't realize what we're doing. And what Jesus does here, I think, one commentator has called, and I agree with him, he, he calls what Jesus says here to these disciples uh, metaphorical hyperbole. You can write that down if you want. Metaphorical hyperbole. He's making a point by talking in extremes. I don't think he means that we should literally cut off our hand or our foot or pluck out our own eye. What is he saying? Sin is so awful and dangerous, and it has consequences beyond this life. We don't want to have anything to do with it, especially not to hinder someone else because of my bad attitude or sin towards them. There are consequences for that. I also don't believe he's talking about a believer who could lose their salvation and end up in hell. 
This would con contradict the very essence of the gospel that came out of Jesus' own mouth when he spoke to Nicodemus in John 3. He said to him, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he's not believed in the name of the only Son, begotten Son of God. When Jesus uses this strong language in Mark, he is saying that his disciples are called to be servant representatives of Jesus in every single relationship in their life, no matter how hard or difficult the other person is. No matter how much we disagree with them. If we serve another believer in Jesus with any simple encouragement, like a cup of water, we won't lose our reward. But if, on the other hand, we become the cause and agent of somebody somehow drifting away from God because what we said or did to them, we're going to experience a loss of reward. That's the point. Note it in the metaphor. We'll enter life, but we're going to lose something when we do. Something as important as a hand, or a foot, or an eye. Lost. We'll enter life, we'll enter the kingdom of God, but this is so important, we got to get it through our head, Jesus says to his disciples. The kingdom of, this is important information about the kingdom of God, and what we're doing now will have an impact later. Okay. Like I said, this rattled me, because I'm, <laughs> I am uh, reviewing the outline of my own life and my own uh, relationships to people. Have I been a servant to all? No. But this has caused me to rethink everything. There are two lessons to take away from this very strong rebuke. Warnings for disciples. First, we need to know, and we need to believe this, there is no redeeming value for sinning in our lives. No redeeming value whatsoever. Jesus died. Romans 6 says we're no longer in bondage to that. We can say no by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sin only leads to disintegration of the good, separation from God, and ultimately death and loss. No redeeming value whatsoever. Don't look at it as some sort of wonderful, beautiful thing and pleasure that could give you. It isn't. Don't look at it as some way to promote yourself, to make sure, you, make sure somebody else knows you're better. That's sin. So, we need to ruthlessly deal with sin in our life. <laughs> Not cover, couch, or deny, or whatever. Be careful. Second warning, we need to take not only precaution for our own self, but precaution not to be the agent. Of, of being the cause of someone else falling away from Jesus in their relationship with him. Can't do it. Always be thinking, what can I, what simple thing can I do to encourage this person? How can I just do something simple that, that is of service in Jesus' name to them? Even though I don't like them. Even, <laughs> even though we have nothing in common. Even though we disagree. What simple thing could I do to make sure, hey, we're part of the family of God? Okay, 
If you call yourself a believer and a follower of Jesus, Jesus sums up everything he's been talking about to these disciples in the next two verses. This is the climax. It's all been about the same thing. Disciples treating other disciples. If you call yourself a believer and a follower of Jesus, Jesus sums up next what he's been saying using another metaphor. Salt. Don't lose your saltiness. He completes his private teaching to the disciples with these two verses, for everyone will be salted. Notice the conclusion, because, for, he's bringing, therefore, this is it. This is what I'm trying to say. Therefore, everyone will be salted with fire. And salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, what on earth can make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. He exhorts his followers not to lose their saltiness. Let's unpack that for a minute. There are two metaphors here, salt and fire. First, Jesus said everyone will be salted with fire. And I think he's basically talking about the adversities we'll face in life as a believer. There are many of them. And I believe God's intention for those adversities is to make us saltier. What does that mean? Well, here's how I would describe it. The salty, uh, being salty in, in Je Jesus' teaching here means we walk around uh, with a Christ Jesus savoriness in our life. Other people are thirsty for him because they're around me. Savoriness. They're not repulsed from Jesus because of me. They're actually drawn to Jesus because of me. Have salt among yourselves. Salt is good. And as they go through the fires they'll face as living sacrifices to God, they will become salty. Every person they touch will be encountering the savoriness of the Savior. Because of what that adversity, how God is helping them and changing in their life as they rely and trust in him for that. <laughs> like the example you see uh, with Paul and Silas when they were unjustly put in the Philippian jail. You want to see Christ's savoriness? Here it is. What happens, what could happen in adversity? Uh, Paul and Silas, the crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Mm. That's something to get mad about. My freedom's taken away and I'm being pummeled. Well, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, uh, Paul and Silas were complaining and about the magistrate and all the people that had caused them this time. Oh, wait a sec, that's not what it says. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. You know what's happening? They're becoming salty. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, and the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Well, when the jailer awoke, saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped, and Paul cried out, Hold on. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And he called for the lights, rushed in, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What adversity are you going through? Are you becoming more salty or less? 
when others look on and they see the, <laughs> the image of Jesus being displayed or some other characterization. <laughs> when you lose your saltiness as a disciple of Jesus, what, what on earth can make us salty again? I think Jesus answers that question <laughs> um, a little later for the disciples in John 13, 34, and 35. You know what it is? How we treat other believers makes us salty. A new commandment I give to you guys, that you love one another as I, see, have loved you. How did he love me? Sacrificially. not holding their faults against them. He's praying like crazy in agony in Gethsemane, and they're all asleep. But I'm going to die for you. By this, all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Savoriness of Jesus. It really revolves around service and love. It really does. Um, Jesus ends this application by saying, have salt in yourselves, among yourselves. Christ's savoriness starts here. Be at peace. So the question is, how salty are we? Are people attracted to Jesus because of how we treat one another? Or are they repulsed from Jesus? What kind of people does Jesus want his disciples to become? That's what he's trying to address here. <laughs> Let me lay out the choices for you. Does Jesus want us to become harsh, bitter, judgmental, self-righteous, unwelcoming, mean-spirited, and exclusive? Or does Jesus want us to become kind, loving, welcoming, humble, gracious, generous servants of the Lord? Which one looks more like Jesus? Make your choice. We, in fact, we make the choice every single day. How we treat other believers who belong to Jesus and how we treat others who don't. We're either very salty or we've lost some savor. To live in line with the gospel, we need to change how we look at ourselves and others in relationship to Jesus not to any other thing. Not to the pandemic, not to political affiliation, or any other issue in our culture at this time. Only in relation to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. That's it. Jesus made it very simple. <laughs> to be a follower, we do what he did. Be a servant of all, love one another, be at peace among ourselves. And you know, it's, <laughs> Jesus came as a servant he, to serve us really in the ultimate expression of service by giving his life in our place. What we should have taken we deserved. He took the judgment of God for our sin on the cross so we could have the gift of eternal life. And let me just finish by saying, if you've never had a moment in your life where you just called out and said, I believe you, Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Savior of the world who died for my sin, I invite you into my life. I believe in you for the gift of eternal life. If you've never expressed yourself to God like that, I urge you to do that even today as we close in prayer. You'll find him most loving and compassionate and with you the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have rescued us from the power of sin and death through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. Father, we ask you to help us. We need grace from you, from your Holy Spirit, to treat others as Jesus would treat them. We have a lot to learn. 
Uh, forgive us for where we failed. Help us not to dis ever discourage or hinder others from drawing closer to Jesus. Help us as his disciples to be servants, displaying the saviorness of Jesus in every relationship, beginning with our own family and those in our church. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.